Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Well, this is the last Sabbath of winter. Amen. <laughs> two, more, two more days and springtime will be here once again. But this morning I want to talk to you about two countries. And it's not going to be Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Uh, we might talk about it later perhaps, but not right now. And this morning, I just wanted to share with you a reflection on two countries that are very similar, the USA and Canada. They have a lot in common though, but they are not 100% alike. There are some differences there. And as you could see just a few days ago, perhaps, what was it, a month ago, when the truckers were coming all the way from the west to Toronto, or Ottawa, the capital of Canada. And then the prime minister there says, well, wait a minute, I don't like what you're doing. I don't believe in what I believe. Therefore, I'm going to shut you, shut you down. And they did. How could that happen? Isn't Canada a free country? Isn't Canada like the United States of America? Well, yes, to some degree, but not 100%. So with that in mind, I'm going to go to the, to, the, to the board right here. I'm going to divide it in two. Can you see from the back? Okay, then I'm going to write here July 1st, 1867. And on this side, I'm going to write July 4th, 1776. Independence Day for the United States. I'm from Canada. Different years, of course, but both nations were founded by Protestants, for the most part in Canada, because one province in Canada is French-speaking and is Catholic. And there was a, a war for seven years, and by the way, Washington was a soldier in that war. And he fought on the British side, not on the French side. After seven years, the British won the war. And when they won it, then they took care or they took control of Canada. So now France was not anymore in Quebec. That's a province that is French speaking. Now the British had control of the entire country or territory at that time of Canada. That war prepared Washington for another war. Any idea which one that was? That was the Revolutionary War in, in America. And then he was fighting against the British. During the war in Canada, he was fighting with and for the British. When that happened in Canada, July 1st, 1867, there was a separation between Canada and England, not a divorce. I don't know if you follow me, a separation. So even though they were a country now, the British Parliament had to approve what the Canadian Parliament approved on. And if you remember, England or the United Kingdom is a constitutional monarchy. What is the meaning of that? That you have a, a royal family, monarchy, and they rule the nation by the constitution of the nation. However, that's not the case here. Because July 4th, 1776, the Americans filed for a divorce, not separation. I don't know if you follow with me. That says you, monarchy, George, 
the third, the king there, you rule England, we'll take care of America. And you have nothing to do with us here in America. Let's be friends, yes. Let's do commerce and trade, yes. But you rule England, we'll rule America. So here there was a separation, here there was a divorce. And because there was a divorce, guess what? Now you have to have a constitution. And the constitution in England came from the monarchy. The power came from the monarchy down. You had the, the king or the queen. And then you had the parliament. They have two houses. The upper house is the senate or the house of lords. Which is a do nothing party. When you become a knight in England, eventually you become part of that house of lords. But they don't do anything there. They just dress funny and they have a wig on their head. But they have no power whatsoever in England. None whatsoever. And then you have the parliament, which is the lower house. And that's what the power is today. However, in America, it says, let's, let's do it the other way around. Let's have the power coming from the people. From the bottom, up. Instead of the, instead of the power coming from the top, to the bottom. And that's why there was a constitution. When was that? Let me write it down here. That's the date of the Constitution. As you can see, there were 12 years in between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. That's a long time. Why? Because some states or colonies at the time, they were saying, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, if we want to have a country and we want the power to come from the people up and then we want to have freedom, we have to make sure that we have rights, not just a constitution, because the constitution is to rule the government. But we have to have rights. So it took a while for all the states to come together and say, yes, let's have a constitution, and they eventually ratified the constitution. This is the date. However, there were two states, Rhode Island, little tiny states, even today it's the smallest one, and North Carolina. They were holding, says, wait, wait a minute, what? I mean, we, 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 we like the independence part. We, we like the Declaration of Independence. And we even like the Constitution. However, we need to be sure, we need to make sure that, that, that we have rights. So they demanded a Bill of Rights. That's why we call the 10 First Amendments in the Constitution. Why Rhode Island? Three points. Number one, Rhode Island was founded by Roger Williams. He was a minister. And he fled Massachusetts in the middle of winter. They were chasing him down. Because he was telling the Puritans up in Massachusetts, we need to separate church and state. He was, he was a Baptist, a good minister, a man of God. But we cannot have the state telling us what to do, and the church is not to tell the state what to do. One is civil, the other one is religious. And the Puritans up in Massachusetts said, no, we don't like that. And if you don't change your mind, we're going to chase you down, and chase you out of the state. And he did. He fled. He left his family behind, even. He was not able to take his family with him initially. So at that time when the Constitution was being talked about, there were people in Rhode Island that were Seventh-day Baptist. And they were telling the delegates, we need to make sure that we have religious freedom. Let me give an example. Virginia. If you were an Anglican, that's fine. I mean, the ministers would pay out of the state treasury. The state built churches and schools for the Anglican church. 
If you were a Baptist, you were not welcome. Let me give you an example. One day, Patrick Henry was walking down the street in Virginia, and he was a lawyer. And, and, and then, he, as he was walking, he heard someone preaching. He said, wait a minute, someone is preaching, but it's not church around here. All we have is a state prison. And the closer he got to the building, he noticed that there was a man preaching out of the prison. And he went to the women and the prince said, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm preaching. But, but, but you're supposed to be preaching in church? Well, the state of Virginia is not willing to give me a license to preach. I'm a Baptist. And Henry, uh, Patrick Henry says, hold on, that's not right. You have committed no crime. I mean, if you believe God and you believe that religion is good, you should have the right to express yourself. That's wrong. If you were a Methodist in Virginia at that time, colonial time, they said, well, okay, we'll give you tolerance. You can, go to, you can go to the churches and you can have meetings there and you can preach anything you want. We're even going to give you a license so you can be a minister. However, the only pray, pray place where you can preach is your churches. The Methodist pastor was, were not paid by the state. If they want to have a building, they have to build it themselves and pay for it. So you have the Anglicans, they have all things going for them. You have the Methodists, eh, kind of okay, and then you have the Baptists, no good. That was colonial America for 300 years. Depending on the state you were in, there were more freedom or more tolerance than others. However, in Rhode Island, there was always freedom. That's when the Seventh-day Baptists came to America, they went to Rhode Island. That was the only place where they could keep Sabbath and not be chased down or, or put in prison. Number two, there was a group that came from Italy also to Rhode Island. They were dancing. They had been persecuted by the papacy for a long time. So now the Waldensians came from northern Italy and they settled in Rhode Island. And they were big on religious freedom, as you can imagine. They said, no, we have to have a, a guarantee in the Constitution that there will be religious freedom. And number three, Rhode Island was not happy with the idea of some states having a slavery. No slavery. There was never a slavery in Rhode Island. That's why Rhode Island was the last state to ratify the Constitution. It was not until the constitutional people that were meeting in Philadelphia said, yes, there will be a bill of rights, and these are the rights. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Then Rhode Island says, I'm willing to ratify the Constitution. It was not until 1790, actually, when Rhode Island ratified the Constitution. And also North Carolina. Why? Because there was a group of Waldensians in North Carolina as well. And they were telling the delegates representing the state of North Carolina, make sure that there's really your freedom, not just tolerance. And that's why when the Bill of Rights was established, 1791, if you want to date, December 1791, the First Amendment has to do with what? Religious freedom. Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. Friends, that idea comes from heaven. I don't know if you realize that. Because God made us free. I made us so free that he is not willing to intervene in your conscience. If you want to go the other way, God will respect that. He doesn't agree with it. But if you want to go down, that's your choice. That's your choice. 
So in 1791, eventually there was the Bill of Rights. Not only was freedom of religion, the second part or the second clause of the amendment says that the government cannot intervene in the free exercise of, free, of freedom of religion. So you have two clauses. Congress can make no law regarding religion, none whatsoever, ever. And number two, we are free to exercise our religion as we wish. And Congress, or the government, has nothing to do with it. He cannot make religion, a state religion, but they cannot forbid the people to worship as they want. That amendment then says freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. What is that? What is talking about? Churches. You can meet together any day of the week, any time of the day. As many people or as few people as want to come and join. And Congress or the government has no power to decide what's going on there. That's why when the mandate came, you know, shut down churches, that's unconstitutional, friend. What the government could do and should have done was, well, well there's, a, there's a, a, a virus going on, and we recommend that you don't meet, or perhaps 25% of the people, or 50%. That's a recommendation. And that's it. Then the people decide. That was, that's not the case anymore. They shut it down once and they will do it again. And you, you, you and I will see it soon, right? one, once again. So, and then it says, at the end of the First Amendment, it says that the people have the right to redress the government for grievances. So if I don't agree with the government because the government has done something wrong, I have the right to, to sue the government and say, that's wrong. That's why the Second Amendment has to do with what? With the people being able to bear what? Arms. Arms. See, they were given teeth to the Constitution. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It says the First Amendment is good. And we love it. And we like it. However, to make sure that this amendment is not taken away, we have to make sure that the people will keep it the way it is, not the government. So bearing arms is for self-defense. Are you with me this morning? It's to protect you and your family. It's interesting because when you listen to the news that someone has been murdered, you say, well, because of weapons. Who pulled the trigger? A person. I mean, can I kill someone by driving a car? Is a car evil? Should, should cars be banned? banned? Right? Because it kills, kills people. How about a knife? Can I kill people with a knife? The knife is evil. It's me. It's the people. That's why Adam says the Constitution was made for Christian people. What happens if you have atheists? Or you have Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus? People that have no Christian background whatsoever, the Constitution doesn't make any sense for them. I'm not saying they're evil people. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're good people. Many of them are good people. And many of them will come to the truth eventually. But they have no idea where freedom is. It's only for a Bible-believing Christian, that's a Protestant, by the way, that the Constitution makes sense. When you hear the news that someone has been shot, and once again, we, we, we need to ban arms. Friends, how many counties are there in the United States? Over 3,000. That's to be exact. 3,000. 141 counties. That's a lot of counties, right? 70% of the murders 
take place in 3% of the counties. 75% of the counties have no murder, zero murder, every single year. If you see where the murder, for the most part, takes place, there are cities. 3% of the counties commit 70% of the crimes in America. And the places where the people are armed, little crime, zero murder. Why? Because of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Instead of free weapons, sons, we should have free, of, um, instead of what, what, how do they call it? Wap, weapon free sons? Is that yeah, the name? Gun free, gun free sons? Oh, it should be gun freedom song, if you know what I'm saying. Because the people are not to kill people, but the people are to protect themselves from evil people. And when someone is willing to do evil, we have the right, given by God himself, to protect ourselves. So when you hear the news that there is so much killing going on in America, don't forget it's only 3% of the counties. And 75% of the counties, every single year, they have no murder, none whatsoever. And those places are where the people have more weapons and guns because they're protecting themselves. They are not there to kill anyone because killing a murder is wrong, it's a sin, but they're there to protect themselves. That's why the Second Amendment was so important. And that's why in the Constitution, right here, uh, let's, let's, let's be all right. December 1791. That's why the Constitution provides for no standing army in America. The army that we have today is not constitutional. The president had the right to request Congress an army for two years. And the Congress, if they agree, they will fund, fund the army for two years. And there was a need for more army than the president has to request once again an standing army for two years. If there's a crisis, we'll have an army, one or two years, over, no more crisis, no more army. Why? Because the founding father could see what the army did over in Europe. They were supporting the monarchy and the papacy. And the people were oppressed, killed. Nations were invaded and destroyed and looted by the armies. And said, no, we don't want that in America. If we have a crisis, we'll get the people together. A year or two, no more than that. And we'll get rid of the crisis. In the meantime, we have a free army. Citizens that are armed. And we don't have to pay for that. The people themselves will pay for it. There was a lot of wisdom. You know how much money we spend nowadays on army? Billions of dollars. Billions. It's, it's unbelievable. Going back to Canada, there was no constitution. I mean, there was a constitution, but it had to be approved by the British Parliament. And they came. It was not until 1931, the agreement of Winchester. There, Canada filed for a divorce, if you know what I'm saying. And the British Parliament says, okay, well, now you make your laws. We don't have to, okay, what you do over there is your country. But it was not until 1982 when the divorce was final. 
So when that happened, Canada did not have a constitution like America. No bill of rights. And it was not a partisan constitution because it was constitutional monarchy. So the power from the people to the top, here the power from the top to the bottom, the people. So in 1988, Canada drafted what is called, um, what was the name of it? It's, it's like a bill of rights, but it's not the kind of bill of rights that we know here in America. Oh, it's a human right agreement where now the parliament was given to the people in Canada the right to be free. However, in that agreement, the human right agreement, there was a clause. It's called Emergency Act. In case the, the country, Canada, is facing an emergency, that human right bill is put aside until the emergency is dealt with. What happened then just a few months or a few weeks ago? The Prime Minister says, I'm invoking the Emergency Act. What happened to the bank accounts of the people being part of the protests in Canada? They shut it down. Your money. What was the crime? You disagree with the government. That was the only crime. And that's not a crime, by the way. Even the people that donated to the trucks, to the truckers, not, they were not there. They were not protesting. They were not doing anything. They were perhaps miles away from what the protest was. What happened to the bank accounts? They shut them down. Even the businesses that were having boycotted. No, we cannot support you. Why? That did not happen in America. I should, the president we have will be happy to do that. Because still the Bill of Rights and the Constitution that came out of the Declaration of Independence is still, to some degree, a little degree, not as much as it used to be, still implanted in the mind of the American people. You notice that right away, when the truckers were coming to Washington, D.C., and not just here, but also in other countries, convoy, freedom convoy, what happened? The COVID virus was cured. And then there was a war going on from one day to the next. They knew that there were too many people waking up around the world, not just in Canada, and the Canadian people are very peaceful. You never hear about Canada. There's not much going on there ever. But if the Canadian was waking up and the people in Canada were supporting the truckers, and the Americans were supporting the Canadians. And there were people around the entire world doing what the Canadian trucker did. Even in America, says, wait a minute. This virus thing is not good no more. We better get rid, rid of it. And let's create another crisis. And now we have another crisis. Because that's a distraction as well. They knew that the truckers coming to Washington, D.C., eventually they got there, but that's not as many as in Canada. It was not as visual and as it was in Canada. They were not able, or, they, or the government would not be able to do what the Canadian government did. So today in Canada, you have a dictator. Whatever he thinks that it should be done, 
That's the law of the land. And the people have no way, no way of undoing that. Even if you take it to court, the court has to agree with the government. By the way, who appoints the judges? The government. So they are government employees. They like their job security, if you know what I mean. So they're not going to go against the grain, especially in Canada. So even the people that were there, they were not just showing. They were just saying, we do not want more mandates. That's all they were saying. Let's do away with the mandates. We don't want to be vaccinated, or we don't want people to be forced to be vaccinated. By the way, 90% of the truckers were vaccinated. So they were not against vaccine. What they were against is the government forcing people to vaccine other people. And just because they voiced their opinion. You had the police, mounted police in Canada, trampling over people, injuring people. And the protest was done away with. Of the money that they raised for fuel, over $10 million, not a penny went to them. Go find me. You know what it is. It says, the Canadian government and the American government says, don't give the money to the truckers in Canada. That's why big business love big government. Because they protect each other. That's why corporations love big government. Because they protect each other. And the money was not given to the truckers. In many cases, it was not even given back to the people that donated it. They confiscated that money. They stole the money. That's what they did. Legally. Legally. Even the people that were arrested because they were protesting in Canada. When this bail was set, they said, well, you have to pay bail until you have a, a hearing. Now the bank account was closed. So bail was denied. However, criminals, bails are not denied. Murders, rapists. But the people protesting in Canada because they were voicing an opinion contrary to the government, they did not have a penny of their own money that they made and worked for to bail themselves out of prison. While the criminals were walking out of prison. Friend, is that going to happen again? Who's going to be the one suffering that? The people of God. And you think that the trucker had a bad deal, just wait until the people of God has to go through it. Because it's going to be a lot more difficult. That's why the tales of two countries. One country had a Republican and a Protestant constitution. The other country did not. Power comes from top to the bottom. So the government that has the power to give you freedom also has the power to remove freedom from you. But not here in America. The Father and Father said, no, no, no. God made us equal. And he made us free. So no government, no institution, had the right to remove your rights. They are God's given rights. And that's why it has taken so long, over 200 years, friends, to destroy America. I mean, it was so well established, so well founded, so solid the principles that made this nation what it was. That it has taken the devil himself 200 years to destroy it. And still it's not 100% God. I mean, it will be God. Don't get me wrong. It will be God. And we're just about this far away from it. But still, the government here in the U.S. cannot do what the government in Canada just did. 
because of this. Praise God for Rhode Island, friends. I was there two weeks ago. And I was telling the people, Providence, that's the capital city. I mean, it's such a small state that it has no counties. There's no counties in Rhode Island. By the way, there's no counties in, in Connecticut either, small states. The state that has more counties is Texas. 254 counties in the state is Texas. But it's a big state. So, so I was there in, Pro, in Providence, and I went to the place where Roger Williams built his church. The first Baptist church in Rhode Island. It's a nice building. It's still there. But I wonder if the people walking by all the time, because it's right there in the middle of the city, realized the importance of the work that that man did. Not just for Rhode Island. You and I, 400 years later, that was 1636 when he was chased out of Massachusetts. That's over 400 years ago. What he did then, it was so powerful that today you and I are benefiting from it. It's a big stature, 14 feet high, of Roger Williams. And I took a picture by him. Um, of course, it's not him, but oh, it's an image of him. So they praise God for a man like Roger Williams. He impacted the American Constitution and also the Bill of Rights, even though he was long gone when that happened. But the mindset was still there, presence. Coming to the end of it, where would you like to be, U.S. or Canada? That's why the U.S. has 10 times more people than Canada. When people think of freedom, they don't think of Canada. They think of what? The U.S. I mean, some people have immigrated to Canada. But just to give you an idea, California has more people than Canada. One state has more people than the entire nation of Canada. And Canada is larger than the United States. But it doesn't have as many people. Why? Because when people think of freedom, they think of the United States of America. That's why this morning we need to thank God for the freedoms that he has given us. Amen. Friends, America will be gone. Don't doubt that. But don't, don't suffer either. Because we're going to heaven. Much better than America. So even though America will be gone and wiped out and destroyed, God has prepared a better place for you and I. And, f and if we are faithful by the grace of God, we will be there and it won't be long. And unfortunately, we will have to see the demise of the American dream. Because this is what's a dream. I mean, even Lincoln, President Lincoln said it. He said, this is an experiment on planet Earth. It had never happened before. Let that destroy it. It should not perish from the face of the earth. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Eventually, it will be destroyed. America will become a third world country. No freedoms. A dictatorial government. And no prosperity. And even today, as we are here today, we can see the beginning of that already, friends. You go to the stores and sometimes you see the aisles halfway empty already. Prices higher than ever before. The inflation is destroying what? The middle class. However, if we love Jesus, we will learn for heaven more than for America. You know, Thomas Jefferson said once, I prefer the dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. 
I do too. Growing up in a communist country, friends, there was no freedom for us. We were second class citizens at best. At best. And when my family and I eventually came to the United States, you have no idea how much we fell in love with this nation. Too. In my heart, it's America that is in the heart. Even though I was not born here. But to see the freedom and the prosperity that God blessed this nation with, you have to fall in love with it. To the point that you're willing to do whatever you can to defend freedom and to keep it. Let me share with you another quotation from Thomas Jefferson. It says, when tyranny becomes law, Rebellion becomes duty. I'm not asking for war. I don't believe in force. I believe the principle of love will always win, sooner or later. But if we are doing nothing to defend freedom, because we know that eventually we'll be destroyed, we're not doing the will of God. We need to do whatever we can within principle to keep it, to defend it, and to promote it. That's the will of God. Now as you go home and perhaps you see the difference, government granting rights to the people. And eventually the government had the right to remove them. In America, God Granting rights to the people, not government. And the power was not resting in Washington, D.C., was resting on the people. That's why, we, let, let, let me give you an, another idea. You have Congress. By the way, there are two branches of government. Congress was supposed to be the strongest one, not the presidency, as it is today. Congress, because Congress is elected by the people. Popular vote. And then you have two houses in Congress. You have the upper house, Senate. And the Senate was to be chosen by the state legislature. Until 1913, there was a 17th Amendment to the Constitution where now the people were electing the senators instead of the state. And the states lost a lot of power when that happened. Because the two senators, and every state has two senators, no matter, no matter the size of the state, on how, how many people in it, from little tiny Rhode Island to Alaska, to two senators, equal representation. So the Senate was the state had an arm in the federal government. 1913, that arm was chopped. Now the senators were elected by the people. And the, the states lost their rights. Now they've become providences, a province of the federal government, not a state. Say it was a little country within this, the big country. I don't, I don't know if you follow my, my recently. And every state was like a laboratory where they can try things differently to see how things work. Now, everything comes from Washington, D.C. Because the Senate is not representing the states. The Senate is representing the people in the state. The lower house was the people representation. They were elected by the people. And the more people a state have, the more representation it had. For, for example, the, right now California has the most people, and it has like 52 or 54 representatives in Congress. While you have, for example, Montana, few people have one representative. But when it comes to the Senate, they have two and two once again. It balances out. That's why Congress was divided into two houses, upper house representing the states, lower house representing the people. Then you had the pres pres presidency, executive power. It was elected 
not by popular vote, was elected by college vote. That's the counties, actually. The counties come together. Just to give an example, 2016 there was an election. You had Trump and Hillary Clinton. Hillary won the popular vote by two million, almost. I don't know how many of those votes were legal, but without you know, questioning that. Let's, but she won the popular vote. However, she only won 59 counties out of 3,141 counties. Trump won the rest of the counties. So who is the one that really was representing the vote of the people, the will of the people? Trump. He won the majority of the counties. Uh, whether you like him or not, I mean, I'm, I, I did not vote for Trump in, 19, in 2016 because I'm out of politics. Since 1998, I'm not voting anymore because I follow the council. Do not vote for people, parties, because eventually they're going to destroy freedom, it says, and the sins that they commit while they're in office, God will pl place them on us. I mean, I have plenty with my own. I don't need anybody else's. So, so, so there was wisdom in electing a president representing the entire nation, not just the big cities. Because that's what Hillary Clinton won. New York and Chicago and Los Angeles, you know, Miami, Houston, Philadelphia. She won big there. But when you see the map of the United States, red and blue, only 59 counties voted for her. The rest, over 3,000 counties, voted for Trump. So you had the rural people represented and you had the city people represented as well. So you could hear the voice of the people, not just the big cities, where you have a lot of people. Now the entire nation is well represented in the White House. That was the idea of the founding fathers. So we could have a nation that would be a good nation, free and prosperous. See the tales of two countries. May God bless us, friends. May, may we enjoy the freedom that we have left and do all that we can while we can to preserve it. Not just for us, that would be selfish for the next generation as well.